You're watching the greatest television show in history, other than The Apprentice, Liquid Lunch on Newsmax TV. Hey, welcome back. We're breezing through hour two of a Friday, Freaky Friday edition of Liquid Lunch on Newsmax TV. No, that was not President Donald Trump, but a uh, very good impersonation by our good friend, uh, John D. Domenico. And uh, the president uh, can't be imitated because he's off the charts with his performances. I love when he came out yesterday with his notes in his hand and said, here's what I said. Um, but Johnny D always does a great job for us. Believe it or not, it's actually happened. After days of waiting, we've been building it up. Um, Melissa Chen joins Your us Your prayers again. have been answered. Yes, for those of you who, have, who have been emailing me and DMing me about why do I keep saying she's coming on and she's not on, it's happened. Thank you. Sorry about all the miscommunication. No, it's fine. And your so, traffic. I blame um, John. Uh, why do you blame me for? Well, I went over the reasons after the show, but we'll, we'll, we'll table that for the best of Liquid okay, Lunch. Let's yeah. Okay, let's not forget. Okay, Monday to Friday, all mayhem goes down right here from noon to 2 Eastern. Mm -hmm. um, and then on Saturday at 5 p.m. when you're home, relax and have a little Saturday dinner, mix up a cold drink, put on Newsmax, and you get the best shots of liquid lunch, which is the best interviews from the week, and all the stuff we talk about behind the scenes, and all the zaniness that goes on, and all the fights I have with the crew. That's all borne out for you in plain sight, and uh, you can decide. But... Uh, so, Melissa, uh, we had so many topics we were going to talk about with you I this know. week, but they got behind us. And the news cycle but, um, just moves But Frank, so you wants to talk about um, this uh, persecution of Muslims in, in China. Do you know much about this story? Uh, yeah, I would say um, most of my articles so far um, you know, that I've written for Spectator USA have been about uh, the China issue in different forms. I've talked about it um, you know, when, when the Chinese Communist Party celebrated this big anniversary. Um, so I've, I've written several articles kind of going hard against it and um, kind of supporting even Trump's trade policies on, on so China. So they have so. the Uyghurs out there in China, yes, which are Muslim uh, minorities in China. Yes. We learned recently about a little bit about how China is treating the Uyghurs. Right. What are they doing exactly? So there was a massive internal document leak. Um, I think it was just a few days ago that the New York Times reported 400 pages of internal documents from the Chinese Communist Party from within the party was leaked. And this detailed Chinese government talking points about how to deal with returning Uyghur Muslim students who are going home to Xinjiang, which is where they live, mm. um, and, and, and they're going to discover that their relatives are in prison. So how is the Chinese authorities of Xinjiang going to talk to these returning students? Because they're free to go and they might talk, they might spread rumors. And so this detailed the, the Chinese communique about how to deal with this issue. Um, and it was very revealing, it revealed um, exactly how the Chinese government was, um, you know, how these camps were arranged, why they were doing it. They said it was to, to prevent unhealthy thoughts that, that the Uyghur Muslims were infected. And, and until they were cleansed of these thoughts, they, they couldn't be free. Now, the Chinese government says they're just concerned about rooting out terrorism and Muslim extremism. Is there any, is there any truth to that? Well, so I think this whole thing started in 2014 when Xi Jinping actually was touring the first time that he was in Xinjiang. And it was shortly after uh, there was a terrorist attack there. There was a bombing. And so he kind of clamped down really hard and said this was a matter of security. Mm. Um, you know, this Xinjiang is actually on the border of Pakistan and on the border of um, Afghanistan. So it's kind of, Xinjiang actually means frontier in Mandarin. So it's, it's seen as this place where, where, you know, it's on the frontier and there are all these like minorities and it's a powder keg. We don't know if things are just kind of going to blow up. But on the other hand, there's another thing that's been happening in China. It's just that um, the Chinese party in general wants to enforce some sort of conformity of thought because you know, it's easier to run a dictatorship when you don't have um, sort of dissenters or, or, or people that are too different. So that's kind of what they're trying to, to root I've out. I've been saying that around here for weeks now. It's so much easier to run a dictatorship with no dissenters. You're talking about your crew, though. We have way more dissenters than dictators around here. I can tell you that. But, uh, you know, you introduced me over the last couple of weeks to some really interesting, hopefully, future guests. Yeah. And... Um, in your side time when you're not the New York City editor for The Spectator USA, um, 
you spend a heck of a lot of time running a nonprofit yeah. that goes out and tries to get you know educational materials across borders and de-radicalize uh, younger kids who are being radicalized in a lot of or prevent it even before they they get to the point where prevent they can them be from being right. radicalized. And by Inoculation. The, the website, if people want to learn more, is ideasbeyondborders.org. Yes. Ideas Beyond, Beyond. Borders. Right. Um, and um, you introduced me to one of your friends yesterday. Yep. Um, who at one point was one of the chief propagandists for Al Qaeda, yeah. um, but now he's working with one of the heads of the NYPD terrorism units to try to get into the dark web yeah. and get counter programming out there to, to defeat right. propagandists. Right. Like this is still very much a, a war of ideas, and um, that's what I think the the West has kind of not re has not really. Um, done is is that realize like you know what we have a lot of we have access to information completely open you know a lot of these dictatorships the first thing they do is censor so if you look at rising dictators like um, you know what's happening in Turkey what's happening in China what's happening in North Korea the first, the first thing they do is they just cut off information because when the populace cannot read alternative viewpoints there's no the governments can basically just concentrate and hoard power in a way that's just completely long-term and no one challenges their rules. It's so funny that you mentioned cutting off information and stifling debate because that's exactly what happened this week on MSNBC when they had the Democratic presidential debate, 10 candidates up there, um, and in spite of the fact that this debate went on for two hours, there was a half hour straight before they let Andrew Yang answer a question. Um, is this an example of either the DNC or these big media networks trying to rig the, uh, the, rig the primary? I think so. Um, I mean, we've seen that before. It happened before with Bernie. Um, and that's kind of been an issue here in the U.S. too. So you start to see you know, censorship even happening on college campuses, happening in different, even in media. Uh, certain talking points are not allowed. And then, you know, culture wars, right? Like that's the whole premise of culture wars here on Twitter where, where people erupt and, and say, you know what, th these viewpoints are not allowed anymore. And we're, we're kind of, you know, it's not the government doing it, but, but we're kind of creating this self-censorship. No, that's a great point. One final question, Melissa, as you know, I have a lot of very good friends in managerial roles in the restaurant business, including some who come on the show from time to time. And I understand that you were with your dog for two straight hours yesterday yeah. in a restaurant. Yes. And Bobby that Vance. this dog did not make a peep the entire time. No. And it's led to some Unlike speculation. Today. Right. Well, it's led to some <laughs> speculation in the restaurant community that you that you may have drugged your dog in order to keep <laughs> him or her quiet. Is there any truth to that? Can you dis, can you put that rumor to bed? Was I, will, <laughs> I will put that rumor to bed, but but that dog has been ho hospitalized twice for marijuana overdose and it wasn't my fault. Oh boy. Oh, I, I will okay. say that. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I almost named you can't him leave those gummy bears I laying around the Snoop. apartment. You know what I'm saying? The, the jelly C B D jelly so my goodness. hopefully you're in a state where it was legal, but um you know, this is uh, well, these are all allegations, yeah. and uh, a dog knows how to party. If you want, <laughs> I want to be a <your> dog, <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. Uh, she's a serious person, she does a lot of serious things. The main thing is, uh, she's a New York City editor for Spectator USA magazine, one of the oldest, most respected magazines around the world. And if you want to know what's happening in New York City, it goes through her. Um, and she's bringing us a whole host of other guests that are going to be doing things to really help our country defeat radical extremism across the country, across the world. So uh, hopefully she'll be back with us again. Hopefully we don't have to ask her three times to get it down here once, but who knows? No, we've worked out the arrangements, yeah. problems. It's all arranged yeah. now. Perfect. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We've arranged for another uh, 20 minutes or so of this show for this week. And uh, we're going to try to get through it. You stay right there. We'll be back after this.